Section 2 of The Magic of the Horseshoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doty in Auburn, Washington, April 3, 2022. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence. The Magic of the Horseshoe, Part 2. Section 5, Crescents and Half-Moon-Shaped Amulets. The alleged predominant influence of the moon's wax and wane over the growth and welfare of vegetation was formally generally recognized. Thus, in an almanac of the year 1661, it is stated that, if any corn, seed, plant be either set or sown within six hours, either before or after the full moon in summer, or before the new moon in winter, having joined with the cosmical rising of Arcturus and Orion, the Hedi and the Siculi, it is subject to blasting and canker. Timber was always cut during the wane of the moon, and so firmly rooted was the superstition that directions were given accordingly in the Forest Code of France. An early English almanac advised farmers to kill hogs when the moon was growing, as thus, quote, the bacon would prove the better in boiling, end quote. Even at the present time, a host of credulities regarding the moon is prevalent among the ignorant classes of different lands. Thus, for example, the Negroes in the vicinity of Washington, D.C., believe that potatoes should be planted before the new moon in order to thrive, and among the Negroes and Indians of the state of Missouri, the proper time for weaning a baby or calf is determined by the lunar phases. Moon worship was one of the most ancient forms of idolatry and still exists among some eastern nations. A relic of the practice is seen in some parts of Great Britain in the custom of bowing to the new moon. Astrologers regarded the moon as exerting a powerful influence over the health and fortunes of human beings, according to her aspect and position at the time of their birth. Thus, in a Manual of Astrology by Raphael, London, 1828, she is described as a, quote, cold, moist, watery, phlegmatic planet, and partaken of good or evil as she is aspected by good or evil stars. End quote. The growing horned moon was thought to exert a mysterious beneficent influence not only over many of the operations of agriculture, but over the affairs of everyday life as well. Hence doubtless arose the belief in the value of crescent-shaped and cornet objects as amulets and charms. Of these, the horseshoe is the one most commonly available, and therefore the one most generally used. In astrology, the moon has indeed always been considered the most influential of the heavenly bodies by reason of her rapid motion and nearness to the earth, and the astrologers of old, whether in forecasting future events, or in giving advice as to proper times and seasons for the transaction of business affairs, first ascertain whether or not the moon were well aspected. This was also a cardinal point with the shrewd magicians of later centuries. And should any one require proof of the existence of a modern belief in lunar influences, let him consult that Gill's Almanac for the year 1898. Therein he will find it stated that when the sun is in benefic aspect with the moon, it is a suitable day for asking favors, seeking employment, and traveling for health. Venus in benefic aspect with the moon is favorable for courting, marrying, visiting friends, engaging maidservants, and seeking amusement. Mars, for consulting surgeons and dealing with engineers and soldiers. Jupiter, for opening offices and places of business, and for beginning new enterprises. Saturn, for having to do with farmers, miners, and elderly people, for buying real estate, and for planting and sowing. For, says the Oracle of the Almanac, astrologers have found by experience that if the above instructions are followed, human affairs proceed smoothly. In his work entitled The Evil Eye, London, 1895, Mr. Frederick Thomas Elworthy calls attention to the fact that the half-moon was often placed on the heads of certain of the most powerful Egyptian deities, and therefore, when worn, became a symbol of their worship. Indeed, the crescent is common in the religious symbolism not only of ancient Egypt, but also of Assyria and India. The Hebrew maidens in the time of the prophet Isaiah wore crescent-shaped ornaments on their heads. The crescent is a well-known symbol of the Turkish religion. According to tradition, Philip of Macedon, B.C. 382-336, the father of Alexander the Great, attempted to undermine the walls of Byzantium during a siege of the city, but the attempt was revealed to the inhabitants by the light of a crescent moon. 
whereupon they erected a statue to Diana and adopted the crescent as their symbol. When the Byzantine Empire was overthrown by Mohammed II in 1453, the Turks regarded the crescent, which was everywhere to be seen, as of favorable import. They therefore made it their own emblem, and it has since continued to be a distinctively Mohammedan token. In the Mussulman mind, the new moon is intimately associated with devotional acts. Its appearance is eagerly watched for, and the moment the eye lights on the slight thread of silver in the western twilight, it remains fixed there, whilst prayers of thanksgiving and praise are offered, the hands being held up by the face, the palms upward and open, and afterwards passed three times over the visage, the gaze still remaining immovable. Golden crescents of various sizes were among the most primitive forms of money. Ancient coins frequently bore the likenesses of popular deities or their symbols, and of the latter, the crescent appears to have been the one most commonly employed. It was the usual mint mark of the coins of Thespia in the early part of the 4th century B.C. is seen on the coins in the reigns of Augustus, Nero, and other Roman emperors, and on the silver pieces of the time of Hadrian, is found in the lunar crescents with seven stars. A crescent adorned the head of the goddess Diana in her character of Hecate, or ruler of the infernal regions. Hecate was supposed to preside over enchantments and was also the special guardian and protectress of houses and doors. The Greeks not only wore amulets in the shape of the half-moon, but placed them on the walls of their houses as talismans, and the Romans used phalery, metallic discs, and crescents to decorate the foreheads and breasts of their horses. Such ornaments are to be seen on the comparisons of the horses on Trajan's column and on other ancient monuments in the collection of Roman antiquities in the British Museum and in medieval paintings and tapestries. In the portrayals of combats between the Romans and the Dacians on the Arch of Constantine, the trappings of the horses of both armies are decorated with these emblems, as are also the bridle reins of a horse shown in a French manuscript of the 15th century representing, quote, gentlefolk meeting on horseback, end quote. Charms of similar shape made of wolf's teeth and boar's tusks have been found in tumuli in different parts of Great Britain. A sepulchral stone, which is preserved among other Gallo-Roman relics within the Chateau of Chinon, France, bears the effigy of a man standing upright and clad in a large tunic with wide sleeves. Above the figure is a crescent-shaped talisman, a symbol frequently found in monuments of that period. But the use of these symbols, although so ancient, is by no means obsolete. The brass crescent, an avowed charm against the evil eye, is very commonly attached to the elaborately decorated harnesses of Neapolitan draught horses, and is used in the East to embellish the trappings of elephants. It is also still employed in like manner in various parts of Europe and in the England of today. In Germany, small half-moon-shaped amulets similar to the ancient Unvioxel or Lunuli are still used against the evil eye. In Sweden and Frisia, bridal ornaments for the head and neck often represent the moon's disc in its first quarter, and it is customary to call out after a newly married pair, quote, Increase, O moon! End quote. Elworthy remarks that the horseshoe, wherever used as an amulet, is a handy conventional representative of the crescent and that the Buddhist crescent emblem is a horseshoe with a curve pointed like a Gothic arch. The English fern called moonwort, Patricium lunaria, is thought to owe its reputed magical powers to the crescent form of the segments of its frond. Some writers regard it as an identical with the martigan, an herb formerly used much by sorcerers, and also with the Italian, Severa Cavallu. According to the famous astrologer and herbalist, Nicholas Culpepper, moonwort, possessed certain occult virtues and was endowed with extraordinary attributes, chief among them being his power of undoing locks and of unshoeing horses. The same writer remarked that, while some people of intelligence regarded these notions with scorn, the popular name for moonwort among the country folk was, quote, unshoe the horse, end quote. Dubartus, in his Divine Weeks, says in reference to this plant, horses that, feeding on the grassy hills, tread upon moonwort with their hollow heels, though lately shod, at night go barefoot home, their maestro musing where their shoes become. O moonwort, tell me where thou hiddest the smith, hammer, and pinchers, 
thou unshottest them with. The horseshoe has sometimes been identified with the cross, and has been supposed to derive its emulatic power from a fancied resemblance to the sacred Christian symbol. But inasmuch as it is difficult to find any marked similarity in form between the crescent and the cross, this theory does not appear to warrant serious consideration. Part 6. Iron as a Protective Charm Some writers have maintained that the look associated with the horseshoe is due chiefly to the metal, irrespective of its shape, as iron and steel are traditional charms against malevolent spirits and goblins. In their view, a horseshoe is simply a piece of iron of graceful shape and convenient form, commonly pierced with seven nail holes, a mystic number, and therefore an altogether suitable talisman to be affixed to the door of dwelling or stable in conformity with a venerable custom sanctioned by centuries of usage. Of the antiquity of the belief in the supernatural properties of iron, there can be no doubt. Among the ancient Gauls, this metal was thought to be consecrated to the evil principle, and according to a fragment of the writings of the Egyptian historian Manetho, about 275 B.C., Iron was called in Egypt the bone of Typhon, or devil's bone, for Typhon in the Egyptian mythology was the personification of evil. Pliny, in his Natural History, states that iron coffin nails affixed to the lintel of the door render the inmates of the dwelling secure from the visitations of nocturnal prowling spirits. According to the same author, iron has valuable attributes as a preservative against harmful witchcrafts and sorceries, and may thus be used with advantage both by adults and children. For this purpose, it was only necessary to trace a circle about oneself with a piece of the metal, or thrice to swing a sword around one's body. Moreover, gentle proddings with the sword wherewith a man has been wounded were reputed to alleviate divers' aches and pains, and even iron rust had its own healing powers. If a horse be shod with shoes made from a sword wherewith a man has been slain, he will be most swift and fleet and never, though never so hard rode, tire. The time-honored belief in the magical power of iron and steel is shown in many traditions of the North. A young herdswoman was once tending cattle in the forest of Vermeland in Sweden, and the weather being cold and wet, she carried along her tinderbox with flint and steel, as is customary in that country. Presently, along came a giantess carrying a casket, which she asked the girl to keep while she went away to invite some friends to attend her daughter's marriage. Quite thoughtlessly, the girl laid her fire steel on the casket, and when the giantess returned by the property, she could not touch it, for steel is repellent to trolls both great and small. So the herdswoman carried home the treasure box, which was found to contain a golden crown and other valuables. The heathen Northmen believed in the existence of a race of dwarfish artisans who were skilled in the working of metals and who fashioned implements of warfare in their subterranean workshops. These dwarfs were also thought to inhabit isolated rocks, and according to a popular notion, if a man chanced to encounter one of them and quickly threw a piece of steel between him and his habitation, he could thereby prevent the dwarf from returning home and could exact of him whatever he desired. Among French Canadians, fireflies are viewed with superstitious eyes as luminous imps of evil, and iron and steel are the most potent safeguards against them. A knife or needle stuck into the nearest fence is sought to amply protect the belated wayfarer against these insects, for they will either do themselves injury upon the former, or will become so exhausted in endeavoring to pass through the needle's eye as to render them temporarily harmless. Such waifs and strays of popular credulity may seem most trivial, yet they serve to illustrate the ancient and widely diffused belief in the traditional qualities ascribed to certain metals. One widely prevalent theory ascribed to iron and meteoric origin, but the different nations of antiquity were wont to attribute this discovery to or invention to some favorite deity or mythological personage. Osiris was thus honored by the Egyptians, Vulcan by the Romans, and Wodan or Odin by the Teutons. In early times, the employment of iron in the arts was much restricted by reason of its dull exterior and brittleness. There existed, moreover, among the Romans a certain religious prejudice against the metal, whose use in many ceremonies was wholly proscribed. This prejudice appears to have been due to the fact that iron weapons were held jointly responsible with those who wielded them for the shedding of human blood, 
inasmuch as swords, knives, battle axes, lance, and spear points, and other implements of war were made of iron. Those mythical demons of oriental lands known as the jinn are believed to be exercised by the mere name of iron, and Arabs, when overtaken by a simoon in the desert, endeavor to charm away these spirits of evil, crying, Iron! Iron! The jinn, being legendary creatures of the Stone Age, the comparatively modern metal is supposed to be obnoxious to them. In Scandinavia and in northern countries generally, iron is a historic charm against the wiles of sorcerers. The Chinese sometimes wear outside of their clothing a piece of an old iron plow point as a charm, and they also have a custom of driving long iron nails in certain kinds of trees to exercise some particularly dangerous female demons which haunt them. The ancient Irish were wont to hang crooked horseshoe nails about the necks of their children as charms, and in Teutonic folklore we find their venerable superstition that a horseshoe nail found by chance and driven into the fireplace will effect the restoration of stolen property to the owner. In Ireland, at the present time, iron is held to be a sacred and luck-bringing metal which thieves hesitate to steal. A Celtic legend says that the name Ironland, or Ireland, originated as follows. The Emerald Isle was formerly altogether submerged, except during a brief period every seventh year, and at such times repeated attempts were made by foreigners to land on its soil, but without success, as the advancing waves always swallowed up the bold invaders. Finally, a heavenly revelation declared that the island could only be rescued from the sea by throwing a piece of iron upon it during its brief appearance above the waters. Profiting by the information thus vouchsafed, a daring adventurer cast his sword upon the land at the time indicated, thereby dissolving the spell, and Ireland has ever since remained above the water. On account of this tradition, the finding of iron is always accounted lucky by the Irish, and when the treasure trove has the form of a horseshoe, it is nailed up over the house door. Thus, iron is believed to have reclaimed Ireland from the sea, and the talismanic symbol of its reclamation is the iron horseshoe. Once upon a time, so runs a tradition of the Ukraine, the border region between Russia and Poland, some men found a piece of iron. After having in vain attempted to eat it, they tried to soften it by boiling it in water, then they roasted it, and afterwards beat it with stones. While thus engaged, the devil, who had been watching them, inquired, quote, what are you making there? End quote. And the men replied, quote, A hammer with which to beat the devil. End quote. Thereupon Satan asked where they had obtained the requisite sand. And from that time, men understood that sand was essential for the use of iron workers. And thus began the manufacture of iron implements. Among the Scotch fishermen, also iron is invested with magical attributes. Thus, if when plying their vocation, one of their number chanced to indulge in profanity, the others at once call out, Called Aaron! and each grasps a handy piece of the metal as a counter-influence to the misfortune which would else pursue them throughout the day. Even nowadays in England, in default of a horseshoe, the iron plates of the heavy shoes worn by farm laborers are occasionally to be seen fastened at the doors of their cottages. When in former times the belief in the existence of mischievous elves was current in the highland districts of Scotland, iron and steel were in high repute as popular safeguards against the visits of these fairy folk, for they were sometimes bold enough to carry off young mothers, whom they compelled to act as wet nurses for their own offspring. One evening many years ago, a farmer named Ewan MacDonald of Duldragan left his wife and young infant indoors while he went out on an errand and tradition has it that while crossing a brook, thereafter called, in the Gaelic tongue, quote, the streamlet of the knife, end quote, he heard a strange rushing sound accompanied with a sigh, and realized at once that fairies were carrying off his wife. Instantly throwing a knife into the air in the name of the Trinity, the fairy's power was annulled, and his wife dropped down before him. In Scandinavian and Scottish folklore, there is a marked affinity between iron and flint. The elf bolt, or flint arrowhead, was formerly in great repute as a charm against divers' evil influences, whether carried around as an amulet, used as a magical purifier of drinking water for cattle, or to avert fairy spite. It seems possible that iron and steel in superseding flint 
which was so useful a material in the rude arts of primitive peoples, inherited its ancient magical qualities. In the Hebrides, a popular charm against the wiles of sorcerers consisted in placing pieces of flint and untempered steel in the milk of cows alleged to have been bewitched. The milk was then boiled, and this process was thought to foil the machinations of the witch or enchantress. The fairies of the Scottish lowlands were supposed to use arrows tipped with white flint, wherewith they shot the cattle of persons obnoxious to them, the wounds thus infected being invisible, except to certain personages gifted with supernatural sight. According to a Cornish belief, iron is potent to control the water fiends, and when thrown overboard enables mariners to land on a rocky coast with safety, even in a rough sea. A similar superstition exists in the Orkney Islands with reference to a certain rock on the coast of Westray. It is thought that when any one with a piece of iron about him steps upon this rock, the sea at once becomes turbulent and does not subside until the magical substance is thrown into the water. The inhabitants of the rocky island of Timor in the Indian archipelago carry about them scraps of iron to preserve themselves from all kinds of mishaps, even as the London Cockney cherishes with care his lucky penny, crooked sixpence, or perforated shilling, while in Hindustan, iron nails are frequently driven in over a door or into the leg of a bedstead as protectives. It was a medieval wedding custom in France to place on the bride's finger a ring made from a horseshoe nail, a superstitious bid, as it were, for happy auspices. In Sicily, iron amulets are popularly used against the evil eye. Indeed, iron in any form, especially the horseshoe, is thought to be effective, and in fact talismanic properties are ascribed to all metals. When, therefore, a Sicilian feels that he is being, quote, overlooked, end quote, he instantly touches the first available metallic object, such as his watch chain, keys, or coins. In ancient Babylon and Assyria, it was believed that invisible demons might enter the body during the acts of eating and drinking, and thus originate disease, and the doctrine of demoniacal possession as the cause of illness is still widely prevalent in uncivilized communities at the present day. Wherever, therefore, such notions exist, talismans are naturally employed to render inert the machinations of these little demons. And of all these safeguards, iron and steel are perhaps the most potent. Quite commonly in Germany, among the lower classes, such articles as knives, hatchets, and cutting instruments, generally as well as fire irons, harrows, keys, and needles, are considered protectives against disease if placed near or about the sick person. In Morocco, it is customary to place a dagger under the patient's pillow, and in Greece, a black-handled knife is similarly used to keep away the nightmare. In Germany, iron implements laid crosswise are considered to be powerful anti-witch safeguards for infants, and in Switzerland, two knives, or a knife and fork, are placed in the cradle under the pillow. In Bohemia, a knife on which a cross is marked, and in Bavaria, a pair of open scissors are similarly used. In Westphalia, an axe and a broom are laid crosswise on the threshold, the child's nurse being expected to step over these articles on entering the room. The therapeutic value of iron and its use as a medicament do not properly belong to our subject, and indeed neither the iron horseshoe nor its counterfeit symbol have usually been much employed in folk medicine. Professor Sepp, in his work on the religion of the early Germans, mentions, however, a popular cure for whooping cough which consisted in having the patient eat off a wooden platter branded with the figure of a horseshoe. In France, also, a favorite panacea for children's diseases consists in laying on the child an accidentally found horseshoe with the nails remaining in it. And in Mecklenburg, gastric affections are thought to be successfully treated by drinking beer which has been poured upon a red-hot horseshoe. Pliny ascribed healing power to a cast-off horseshoe found on the road. The finder was recommended carefully to preserve such a horseshoe, and should he at any future time be afflicted with the hiccups, the mere recollection of the exact spot where the shoe had been placed would serve as a remedy for that sometimes obstinate affection. In Bavaria, a popular alleged cure for hurdy in children is as follows. From a horseshoe wherein all the nails remain, and which has been cast by a horse, a nail is taken and when next a new moon comes on a Friday, one must go into a field or orchard before sunrise and drive the nail by three blows into an oak tree or pear tree 
according to the sex of the child, and thrice invoke the name of Christ, after which one must kneel on the ground in front of the tree and repeat a paternoster. This is an example of a kind of therapeutic measure not uncommon among peasants in different parts of Germany, a blending of the use of a superstitious charm with religious exercises. An ingenious theory ascribes the origin of the belief in the magical properties of iron to the early employment of the actual cautery and to the use of the lancet in surgery. In either case, the healing effects of the metal, whether hot or in the form of a knife, have been attributed by superstitious minds to magical properties in the instruments, whereby the demons who caused the disease were put to flight. In northern India, the natives believe that evil spirits are so simple-minded as to run against the sharp edge of a knife and thus do themselves injury, and they also make use of iron rings as demon scarers, such talismans having the double efficacy of the iron and of the sacred circle. In Bombay, when a child is born, the natives place an iron bar along the threshold of the room of confinement as a guard against the entrance of demons. This practice is derived from the Hindu superstition that evil spirits keep aloof from iron, and even today pieces of horseshoes are to be seen nailed to the bottom sills of the doors of native houses. In East Bosnia, when the cows leave their winter quarters for the first time, an iron bar is laid before the threshold of the door through which the animals must pass, as the farmers believe that, if this precaution were omitted, the cows would prove troublesome throughout the summer. So, too, in the region of Saalfield, in central Germany, it is customary to place axes, saws, and other iron and steel implements outside the stable door to keep the cattle from bewitchment. The Scandinavian peasants, when they venture upon the water, are wont to protect themselves against the power of the neck, or river spirit, by placing a knife in the bottom of the boat, or by fixing an iron nail in a reed. The following is a translation of a charm used in Norway for this purpose. Neck, neck, nail in water, the Virgin Mary cast a steel in water. Do you think? I flit. In Finland, there is an evil fairy known as the Elf Nightmare. Its name in the vernacular is Pinejainen, which means in English, presser. This unpleasant being makes people scream and causes young children to squint, and the popular safeguard is steel or a broom placed beneath the pillow. Friedrich remarks that the Moslems look upon iron as a divine gift, and that the Finlanders have their tutelary gods of this metal. Among the Jews, there prevails a popular belief that one should never make use of a knife or other steel instrument for the purpose of more readily following with the eye of the pages of the Bible, the Talmud, or other sacred book. Iron should never be permitted to touch any book treating of religion, for the two are incompatible by nature, the one destroying human life and the other prolonging it. The Highlanders of Scotland have a time-honored custom of taking an oath upon cold iron or steel. The dirk, which was formerly an indispensable adjunct to the Highland costume, is a favorite and handy object for the purpose. The faith in the magical power of steel and iron against evil-disposed fairies and ghosts was universal, and this form of oath was more solemn and binding than any other. Among the Bavarian peasants, nails and needles have a reputation the reverse of that of the horseshoe. A horseshoe nail stuck into the front door of a house will give the owner a serious illness. A needle, when given to a friend, is sure to prick to death existing friendship, even as such friendship is severed by the gift of a knife or a pair of scissors. Such an untoward result may be averted, however, if the recipient smile pleasantly when the gift is made. A curious superstition about iron locks prevails in Styria and Tyrol. If you procure from a locksmith a brand new lock and carry it to church at the time of a wedding ceremony, and if, while the benediction is being said, you fasten the lock by a turn of the key, then the young couple's love and happiness is destroyed. Mutual aversion will supplant affection until you open the lock.